This is the uh, week four talk in Tricycle's online retreat for January. And uh, I'm going to finish up uh, the, the uh, talks on the precepts that I gave in the uh, previous three talks. Uh, we left off uh, in the, the uh, halfway through the 10 cardinal precepts. We went through the first five talking about the different levels of interpretation, the literal, the essential point, and the, uh, the level of uh, the Mahayana or the compassion level, the greatest good for the greatest number. And now I'm going to go into more depth uh, in precepts six and seven, which are very, very closely related to one another. And these are the, these are the precepts. Number six, a resolve not to speak of the faults of others, but to be understanding and sympathetic. And the seventh, Quite similar, a resolve not to praise myself and disparage others, but to overcome my own shortcomings. I'm going to focus on these two because quite possibly they're the most troublesome to the most number of people. This is what I've heard over time. This is what I've experienced to some extent myself, that these are hard to uphold, these two precepts. Not to speak of the faults of others, but to be understanding and sympathetic. It's, uh, it's so easy to find faults in others, isn't it? It is so easy. This is, this is sort of our reflex, is uh, picking at other people's faults, especially in any kind of uh, intimate relationship, whether it's marriage or some other intimate relationship, or in the close, close relationships of work, uh, it's so easy to blame others. Um, but to do so is to violate uh, our, our true nature in a, in a, in a very real sense. Uh, we could say that whatever the person's doing, whatever their transgression is, is pr usually not as bad as our reacting to it out of a sense of division of self and other. It's also a handy way of looking away from or avoiding our own faults. As long as we have our critical mind on others, then uh, it's a way to avoid seeing what we, the work we have left to do in ourselves. And for that, in that regard, uh, it also gets in the way of uh, meditation practice. Because let's, let's face it, meditation really means turning the mind around. It doesn't just mean facing the wall in a particular formal posture. It means in our relationships, it also means to turn the mind around and look at how we may be contributing to the, the problem. That is to find our own responsibility in the matter. This is the mark of someone who is really on a spiritual path, is, is, is looking at oneself. I find that, that uh, one of the most helpful things in upholding this precept, not that speaking the faults of others, is to recognize that uh, people, people who are uh, violating precepts themselves, people who are transgressing against others, um, are doing so basically because um, they're not happy. They don't feel happy. They don't feel uh, free themselves. So they're, they're picking at others or doing, doing things like that, whatever it is. And um, so to bring into, okay, it's not that we're blind to others' faults, but, but to balance that with an awareness that, that each person is herself or himself fundamentally whole and complete. That uh, what they're doing is not in the deepest sense, it's not natural to be uh, picking at other people, causing transgressions. Um, in the same way, uh, our, our finding fault with others is itself a uh, uh, transgression. Uh, I have found in my own uh, relationships that um, finding fault with one's spouse or one's lover or one's parents or, or whomever uh, 
is very often it's the people who have some quality that we have in ourselves that we don't want to face. Those are the people who bother us the most. Let's, let me go through that again. This is a nice little exercise. If you find that there's someone in your life who annoys you uh, over and over again, someone who uh, bothers you more than other people, consider for a moment, what is that? That trait or those traits that bother you so much about that person, is it possible that there's some of that going on in yourself that you don't want to face? I think often you'll find that there is, that you just, you, you, in yourself, you're keeping it in the shadow. Because you keep it in the shadow, you're, you're quick to, to see it in other people and to have it bother you. So it's a, just, it can be a little helpful exercise in, uh, in taking, in, in sort of um, taking the, the animus out of uh, finding fault with others. There's a nice, some nice words by Confucius. You know, Confucius is not, he wasn't a Buddhist. This, he was before uh, Buddhism came along. Uh, but there's a lot of wisdom uh, in, the, in the Confucian tradition. And I think this is one, one example of it. He says, when you see a good man, think of emulating him. When you see a bad man, examine your own heart. I have a bumper sticker uh, that is the, the, uh, the only bumper sticker I've ever had. It says, mean people are suffering. Uh, you know, I, I guess originally it was uh, mean people suck, uh, which uh, doesn't, doesn't have the same, same quality to it. But, uh, <coughs> but to recognize that um, so-called mean people, people who who we find uh, disagreeable, people who are even hostile or angry, uh, I am convinced beyond any doubt uh, that, um, that they're suffering. And that's another, another thing you can use to diffuse any sense of moral superiority in criticizing others, is when you, when you encounter someone once or more than once who strikes you this way as, as having hostility or anger, try to remember that they're suffering. That's all. They're suffering. Um, a, uh, a, an American, uh, I think by the name of, I think this is uh, Henry Wordsworth Longfellow. Would that be it, Cecily? Henry, is that a person? Henry Wordsworth Longfellow? Wadsworth, thank you. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow um, said the following, if we would read the secret history of our enemies, it would be enough to disarm all hostility. Something to consider. Under this precept, uh, or this one or the next one, they're sort of the same, I would see the problem of gossip, gossiping about others, uh, triangulating, that is complaining about other people, uh, complaining about someone to someone else uh, or other forms of gossip. Gossip, they're finding now in um, psychosocial research, does have uh, some thread of evolutionary value to it. Gossip, they, they're, they're suggesting is a way of, of uh, controlling uh, misbehavior in others. Okay, granted, there may be some truth to that. Uh, but there's also just as much truth, if not more, in how much harm can be done by gossiping. Um, I'm going to read a, a short letter. Um, this is, believe it or not, this is from uh, an Ann Landers column. Um, I don't care if it's Ann Landers or Saddam Hussein, it's got a lot of truth to it. Uh, this is what, what she, actually, this isn't, these aren't her words. She printed it in one of her columns. Uh, I don't know where she got it, but this is how it goes. My name is Gossip. I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. 
I am cunning and malicious and gather strength with age. The more I am quoted, the more I am believed. I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no name and no face. To track me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. I am nobody's friend. Once I tarnish a reputation, it is never quite the same. I topple governments and wreck marriages. I ruin careers, cause sleepless nights, heartache, and indigestion. I spawn suspicion and generate grief. I make innocent people cry in their pillows. Even my name hisses. I am called gossip, office gossip, shop gossip, party gossip. I make headlines and headaches. Before you repeat a story, ask yourself, is it true? Is it fair? Is it necessary? If not, shut up. One of the many things I respect about my teacher, Roshi Philip Kaplow, is that when I would, uh, he, he had always asked me when I was working closely with him as his secretary and his attendant to keep my ear to the ground, as he put it, and let me know of anything that uh, he thinks he thought might be helpful for him to know about. But if I said something uh, secondhand, something I had heard secondhand, so and so is uh, whatever, someone so and so is going to the bars every night. The first thing he would say is, well, have you seen that person yourself doing that? If I said, well, no, but I said, then don't talk to me about it. Don't talk to me about it. So easy to believe uh, things that, that may not be true. And then the seventh uh, precept, I resolve not to praise myself or disparage others, but to overcome my own shortcomings. Praise, praising oneself, is a subtle form of pride. Uh, even dis disparaging others is a form of pride. Uh, Yasutani Roshi said, words are the reverberations of human character have to be so careful how we use words. Um, spreading gossip, praising oneself, disparaging others, this is all works against meditation practice. Praising oneself naturally is building up the self. It's not moving toward no self, the awareness of no self. Disparaging others also, by implication, you're, you're, you're building yourself up. Uh, it implies the other, they go together praising oneself and disparaging others. Here's another, another story that uh, many people enjoy. Uh, it's called Cookies at the Airport. And I don't know, there's no attribution to this. I don't know who said it, but um, I'll run through it. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shops bought a bag of cookies and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man sitting beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag in between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock. And as the brazen thief diminished her stock, she was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I would blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat. 
Then she sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If mine are here, she moaned in despair. The others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. The last, th uh, the last three precepts I'll just mention in passing. Uh, the eighth is not to withhold spiritual or material aid, but to give them freely. The, ni the uh, ninth is not to indulge in anger, but to exercise forbearance. Um, just let me mention that uh, the, the wording of this here used to be a resolve not to become angry. A resolve not to become angry. And we changed it. Why? How do you resolve? How do you prevent becoming angry? It's not, it's not in our control. What is in our control is whether we tantrum, whether we vent our anger in a destructive way. That is something we don't want to do. But to become angry, to feel anger arising in us, this is something we can't, we can't prevent if it happens. And uh, a more intelligent thing is to learn how to work with anger as it's rising in us. The first thing is, and above all, the most important thing, is to notice when we're getting angry. This may seem like the simplest thing to do. How could you not know when you're angry? But the truth is, when we're angry, we are very often so focused on the object of our anger, that guy, that woman, we're so focused on that person that we, we, we lose awareness of our own anger. So this is the big thing. And uh, I will say a little more about this precept, but, but the most important thing is to learn to notice when you're getting angry. Learn to notice the physical signs, uh, your heartbeat increasing, uh, maybe your palms sweating, maybe you're getting choked up in the throat some, you're getting flushed in the head. The crucial thing is to recognize anger. Then you've got a little distance from it. Then you've got some detachment. You can say, okay, I'm getting angry here. And then that gives us, gives us the ability to work with it, to do something about it, uh, to not vent, not indulging in anger. To be human means to get angry at times. It's the degree and it's the way we manage or don't manage the anger. That's the, the crucial thing here. And it all starts with recognizing anger as it's coming up. I think for people in, in spiritual practice, meditation practice, uh, there's a tendency to think that if we shouldn't be getting angry, we shouldn't. Oh, hello. Uh, we're human beings. Part of the vitality of a human being is to get angry at times. But we just have to find ways to uh, actually to express the anger in a healthy, uh, controlled way. If we try to suppress it, then it's going to come out sideways. Sooner or later, uh, chances are we're just going to blow our stack and then we create all kinds of pain in other people. So find a way to level with people, to speak directly. Uh, when you say things like that, I find myself getting angry. When you do things like that, I find myself getting angry. This can, this can really actually help us get more intimate. This is a way to become closer to someone is rather than just backing off, suppressing the anger, it's a way to develop closeness with someone is to express the anger. In a, in, a, in a reasonable way. And then the last of the ten precepts is not to revile th the three treasures, it's Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, but to cherish and uphold them. And in a way, this last one covers all the previous nine as well, because when we're cherishing our Buddha nature, our true nature, then we are honoring uh, that in us, in us which is described in the precepts, or that which in us which is most noble and most honorable in ourselves. It's really, um, it's really honoring our true self when we uh, resolve, when we do not revile the, the Buddha. Same with Dharma and same with Sangha. 
One last thing about anger. Uh, if you find yourself blowing up at someone and yelling at them and, and saying nasty things, the best thing you can do is to apologize to them. Uh, the sooner the better. It can really do a lot. It's hard. It's very difficult to apologize when you just lost your temper. It doesn't have to be immediately, but as soon as you can, apologize to the person. This also is a way of uh, honoring uh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Well, our time is up now. Uh, we'll stop. Thank you for watching and listening. And uh, above all, uh, I urge you to do the daily meditation and in that way find it easier to uphold these, these precepts.